friends, and welcome to Late Night America. As a program note, to start us off, Trigvi McDonald, son of Congressman McDonald, who was killed in the uh, Korean air tragedy not so long ago, not be with us tonight, but uh, uh, Trigvi and the pastor of his church will be with us on Friday. Later in the program tonight, we'll find out everything we need to know about nutrition and how food affects behavior and performance in youngsters. Right now, the return of America's foremost atheist, Madeleine Murray O'Hare. She holds the record for the highest number of attempted phone calls on our show since we've been on the air, oh, I guess about a year and a half, more than a year and a half. The lines are open right now for you to get on the phone, 313-872-4040. How are you tonight? I'm always good. Okay, it's good perennial. to be here. Why do you think you might have gotten so many calls last trip out? Oh, I have always done that. I think no matter what station I go on or no matter what college I go to, I, I break records in a continuing way because I feel that the issue of religion is hotter than a great number of persons think that it is. And certainly confrontation with religion of a person saying that it's no damn good, uh, that it's dangerous to the mental health uh, automatically triggers the do kind you think, of response. Do you think you make get. people angry? No, I think the people basically in the United States are angry uh, right at this particular uh, season of the political climate. And in addition to that, I represent uh, in the flesh all of the doubts that they have. And they would like to get rid of their doubts about a great number of things in the American system right now. So I happen to be a target for that. What are you tying yourself into the political climate to explain that? Well, the reason that I am is because right now almost every single heated social issue is related to religion. And uh, all of the issues that Ronald Reagan, for instance, uh, want to, wants to pull out in order to reseat him in the White House are social issue related. Uh, the, the issues, of course, are sex education and tighter marriage laws and uh, the return of control of the f uh, father in the family, abortion, uh, prayer in schools, uh, tax credits uh, for parents who are sending their children to parochial schools. All of these things are absolutely uh, religious oriented and it's the religious community that is fighting uh, on all fronts in order to return uh, the United States to the Middle Ages. Why, do you think that people um, don't think you have a right to be so outspoken about atheism? Do you think that plays any role in it at all and that makes them a little bit angry? Dennis, there is an assault against three different things in the United States right now. One is an assault against education, another against uh, science, and another against women. And in those assaults on education, the first thing that must be stifled is freedom of speech. Mm -hmm because those persons who are defending those three need to be stopped. And uh, there is an assault by the religious community on freedom of speech throughout the United States right now. I think that uh, television programs are in difficulty uh, as more and more pablum is dished out to the uh, nation. There's no sense of the need for dialogue on issues, but rather uh, the need to entertain with unending chase scenes. Mm-hmm, yeah. Now, um if, uh, if you have the right to believe whatever you want, you know, or not believe, does an atheist believe in something or not believe in something? We have absolutely no belief systems because if you look up the word belief in the dictionary or in the encyclopedia or any place else you go, it says acceptance on faith. And we don't accept anything at all on faith. We examine everything, we question everything, uh, we look at the reason for it and uh, challenge authority. What I'm doing is, a, is finally challenging an ultimate authority. Other people challenge their parents, the school system, the state, and I am challenging the ultimate authority. Now, if you have a right not to believe what you want, yes. do we all have a right to believe what we want? I don't care what anybody believes, and I'm totally uninterested in whether or not there are religious systems up to the point that I am taxed heavier in order to support that system. Mm -hmm. I think that religion ought to be a private affair of the church and the home, and that politics and education should be totally secular and divorced from that, and we should rely upon what the Founding Fathers saw as a beautiful precept that is complete and absolute separation of state and church. I mean, think about three or four issues in the news right now. Uh, Indeed. Uh, the president is pushing very hard for prayer in the public schools. We did a program about that recently. 
Uh, we have uh, ministers very, very much involved in yes. politics, as you say. Not in only Nick Peck and all of the others. Are you have Jerry religious. Falwell over here. You have Jesse Jackson over here. I mean, people, yes. uh, people are really, really heavily involved. Uh -huh. uh, then there was an article yesterday in the paper that talked about uh, some young girl, and the, the conflict was whether the judge was going to force her to have some medical treatment. She or had the tumor on her leg, and uh, the tumor on her leg may... Uh, involve itself with her spinal column, and there's a possibility that that has already developed. And, and the, the parents, parents are saying that uh, she should be permitted to die. I think that that's a disgrace to well, the Well, it's human not community. so much that she should be permitted to die. I mean, Join her maker. Well, the, that <laughs> God will take care, huh? God doesn't take care of us. He has never taken care of us in human history, and quote, God is not going to take care of us now. Uh, if that is for uh, medical reasons or political reasons or uh, reasons of the enormous difficulties in which we find that our culture is. There is no God, any place to help us. We have to do it ourselves, Dennis. Well, I, and, and see, you and I have uh, had conversations before, and I certainly believe that we have to do our part, but then I carry it a little further. But you know that. I know that. What are you all uh, uh, bothered about about this textbook business? Talk about that for a second. Well, I'm bothered because we are stationed in Austin, Texas, as you know, and Austin, Texas is the capital of the state of Texas, and the school books of the nation actually are determined by the textbook commission, sele uh, selection commission of the Board of Education of the state of Texas because we buy so many books for the uh, Texas school systems, $20 million a year, mm -hmm. and the texts that we buy last for eight years and these have been influenced by several fundamentalist evangelical Christians uh, over the last 20 years to such a point that all of our textbooks show such an extraordinary Christian bias that I was uh, astounded reading through them Give me some recently. examples. Uh, well, for instance, uh, I do not feel that uh, there should be a statement in any Bible at all that Moses parted the, I mean, in any school book at all, that Moses parted the Red Sea and parting the Red Sea with a picture of this with uh, um, a movie star involved in the parting, uh, that this should be a part of the text that is presented to children. There is absolutely no historical evidence from Egypt or anywhere else of that vicinity that the Jews made a massive exit uh, from Egypt at any time. And I feel that, as an example, that should not be put in there as a miraculous escape uh, in order to satisfy our foreign policy, which is why I feel that it is in, in that we are supporting and protecting the state of Israel. I think that sometimes when you raise, you know, I, I, I might agree that maybe that shouldn't be in a book. What was that, like a history book or a sociology I, book? The or? things that, that I have been reviewing, and I mean things, are textbooks for history for the grades from uh, 0, 07 to 12. Okay, so supposing you and I can agree that maybe that shouldn't be in there. I don't know if I would agree with you that the reason that it's in there is so deeply tied up with the political framework of the country. I'm not going to argue with you on that. I think that you have a right to an opinion in respect to that, and I also have a right to an opinion mm -hmm. uh, from reviewing the books. I think that the other thing, for instance, that it's uh, absolutely ridiculous to say that the Roman Catholic Church was the single entity uh, which protected our heritage from the uh, Greek and Roman um, uh, philosophers and, and educators, etc., and that without the Roman Catholic Church, we wouldn't have the culture that we have today in respect to progress, because I think that to ignore the Inquisition, to ignore the Dark Ages, to sweep them away entirely, uh, that this is no way for a history textbook uh, to permit children to view the past. We have to learn from the past. And if the past isn't totally exposed, we're not going to learn our lessons. No. So the uh, textbooks bother you. You say they're Christianizing the textbooks. Men uh, or lady or woman or whatever the case yeah. may be, you must really go right through the roof when you hear that President Reagan is designating a year as the year of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, that must not sit well with you at all. Well, that has produced two things. We got out a Bible handbook in which we look at the Bible, uh, and we're, we're the only uh, press in America that puts out atheist books, and we look at the absurdities, the, uh, the hatred, uh, the vengeance, the vindictiveness, the, uh, um, abs well, I said absurdities, the contradictions, everything in the Bible, 
And this has been a good year for us with sale of that book. In addition to that, I now have a lecture which I give, which is so hilarious that uh, I've thought I should perhaps take it to Vegas and go from there. It's called The Bible According to St. Madeline, in which I get up and simply deliver a one-hour lecture on the Bible, uh, pointing out exactly what it is and what I think of it. Well, you know what I've always said, Madeline, you know, when you get the faith, when you're struck, you will be St. Madeline, there's no doubt about that. We are going to uh, let you jump on the telephone right now. Madeline Murray O'Hare is our guest, America's foremost atheist, and uh, we are going to uh, proceed ahead with your phone calls coming up next on Late Night America. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hey, this is Pat from West Lafayette, Indiana. Go ahead, Pat. Two questions like uh, your guest to comment on. What is it that turns you off most on religions? We see it in America today. Is it the power that they express and the means of trying to control our mind to dominate our lives? Or is it the financial aspects that you have to make a contribution to continue on with someone's thoughts as to what religion is supposed to be? Well, I think primarily I'm against the religions, religious community obtaining a minimum of $80 billion a year when that $80 billion a year could go to clean up our skies, our land, our waterways. Uh, it could go toward health. It could go toward, toward education and welfare. And I feel that $80 billion a year is entirely too high of a price for anybody to pay to get into heaven. That's the first thing. The other thing is that uh, everybody listening to me now, today, has felt a sense of personal inadequacy when they were faced with a given situation, whether that's with a husband, uh, with a wife, with children, on their job, something. And I feel that the basis of that, uh, that feeling of personal inadequacy, which is bred into people in the United States, comes from religion. Religion telling them that they need to be dependent, that they're no damn good, that they can't make their own decisions, that they must rely on God, that uh, they must go outside of themselves for a solution. And with that hammered on them daily, I feel that the people of the United States do not need to have that kind of psychological battering. And I'm opposed to religion because it supports it. Do you think in the past, maybe you wouldn't know, but in the past maybe uh, some of the churches were so negative but I see some, uh, a, a positive way of teaching the message now that might not have been there before. <laughs> you can't I mean, teach not... anything positively when the thing that you're teaching is no damn good. Oh, no, 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 come on, no, 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 don't start with me. Don't start with me. How can you, you just say no damn good? I mean, don't It don't isn't. Uh... No, 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 but I mean, say, I mean, you can say punishment, guilt, anger, fear, war. You can put those All on people. All of those things are put, put on people okay. primarily by and religion and primi primarily and around I, human sexuality, too. Okay, and I don't agree with any of that. I don't agree with any of that. But, but maybe we well, can get the thinking a little bit more act. positive. I think yeah. that if, for instance, religions tomorrow, starting with the big ones, uh, the established churches, if the Roman Catholic Church, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, uh, the Baptists, mm -hmm. just those four would come out tomorrow, their leaders, and go to the White House and say, all right, now we are fed up with nuclear escalation. Let's stop it. Well, this planet belongs to all of us. Let's stop war. Well, they could do that one thing well, that's no, good. No, no, they no, refuse no, no, to do anything no, that's good. Now, wait a minute, Madeline. The, the, all the Catholic bishops have been very, very involved in that, and many of the Protestant uh, leaders as well. The Catholic bishops were afraid to use the word freeze. Now, I'll It went back it. and forth, it went back and forth, it went back but and they forth. But they, came out, the out, the they came freeze. out with a very, very strong statement that upset the White House no end. That's right. And so you can't say that they've been sitting, and, and, and at the forefront of all the nuclear freeze movement are many, many religious leaders. Oh, come on, they're tailgating this. The, the freeze movement should have started before Kennedy, and you know that. The churches always tailgate every issue, whether that's the issue of women's rights, whether that's the issues of getting kids out of factories, whether no matter what those issues are, they wait until they see it bandwagging, and then they jump on the tailgate of the truck and say, hey, I was here all the time. 
the religious community could have stopped the escalation of nuclear weapons 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. They have sat there patently doing nothing. And you know that as well as I do. They're saying it now. Incidentally, our organization was the first well, one supporting the Roman Catholic bishops. We got to them the next day and said that this was the finest thing that the Roman Catholic Church had ever done in mm -hmm. its history, and we were proud to see that they had done it. Well, they might have dragged their feet in the past, but they're out there right now. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Thank you, this is John from Pensacola. Go ahead, John. Uh, the question is, are you doing anything about uh, getting the churches who are under local property tax exemption due to state laws declared on the Constitution at the state level so they'll pay their proportionate share of taxes. This was uh, taken up in the early 1970s in the case of Waltz versus New York, and we were um, amicus curiae on that brief. At that time, the that United mean? Uh, Friends of the Court that we um, came into, uh, into the case and attempted to put arguments uh, before the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court at that time said that since the tax exemption of churches on their real estate property was historical, that they should continue to receive that tax exemption. The unfortunate thing is that 25% of all privately owned land in America is now in the hands of religious groups or religious organizations. And this means that your taxes are enormously increased. And I would like to challenge that Supreme Court decision, and we are hoping to do that later in the 80s. Would you, uh, that's a pretty big th move that you're going to Oh, make that's there. an enormous big move. That uh, case would, would cost a million and a half dollars. And uh, I have to seek a subsidy from someone for that. You can get it from one of the, ch no, you wouldn't <laughs> get it from one of the churches. Let me, no. uh, let me, let me say that. Would you uh, say that um, land that they, uh, or holdings that they had uh, that were directly related to trying to help people, okay? You know, this building, is, no, wait, 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 no, let me finish. They don't hurt, help people. Religion hurts people, Dennis. They're very much involved in schools. They're very <laughs> much involved in health. They're very much involved in poor. They're very much involved in the elderly. These are all very, oh, very good on, things. Oh, come on, Dennis. They have moved in on those social services simply because they are seeking converts and attempting to service their own people. No, 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 no. Have you ever seen a young Jew be put into a Roman Catholic orphan home? I have. Have you ever seen have a or young... have not. ...that was put into it? And then, of course, he came out of there, a Roman Catholic. He Are you going to tell me, Madeline Mario, here, you're going to sit here on this program, and I've known you for a couple of years yes. now, that nobody in any church is trying to do any good for just a nice motive for anybody in America? Are you going to say that? No, you're not no, going to say that. No, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that human beings all over the United States and all over the world are humanitarian because people are kind, love-filled, honest, and outreaching and that their religion is incidental to that. The primary thrust is their humanitarian feeling. Let me give you an example. All of the persons who were humanitarian from the year 325 when the Roman Catholic Church seized power until the time of Martin Luther, every humanitarian person was a Roman Catholic. Just remember that. There was no humanitarian persons in Europe because had they not been Roman Catholic, they would have been killed. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hello, this is Roy Monteith from Binghamton, New York. Go ahead, Roy. I'd like to ask uh, Miss or Mrs. O'Hare, does she ever think in her wildest dreams that uh, this country could become a theocracy? This country is a theocracy. What does that word mean? Uh, it means that uh, the government of the nation is supporting the religious community financially. And they are, because the religious community is tax-exempt on their land holdings, they're tax-exempt from sales tax, when you pay more because they don't pay any. They are tax exempt on most of their business income, especially if they can prove that it's, quote, related to the church. And they reach out to such an extent that you can have, for instance, a Mormon church showing that you can get to heaven on the uh, railroad because they happen to own it. So that in a constant way, we pay continually. Uh, the government is supporting almost every single social service by giving funds from a federal level, a state level, a county level, and a city level to every single social service agency run by the church. If the government would remove that money tomorrow, I am convinced that the churches would have no outreach. They're only using that money because it's provided to them by government, and they use it for their own sectarian purposes. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hi, Dennis. Uh, 
in the early part of the program, she uh, implied that she was fighting many uh, organizations in her tax reform. She even said she was challenging the highest authority. Mm -hmm. What did she mean? God. Well, I thought you didn't recognize God. I don't, but since other people do, I'm challenging that authority which they posit, which I feel is no authority at all. I try to take the clothes off and find that there isn't anything there. But I think the point is interesting. If that's, the, that's what you're challenging, you have to admit it exists. Well, no, because let me give you an example. Well, no, well, no. yes. No, if no, let me give you it. an example. Huh? For instance, if you want to discuss with me the characters in a Dickens book, I know they're fictitious, but I can sit here and talk to you about Oliver Twist or Fagin or any other person who is a character in a novel. Mm. In the same way, when I am dealing with a religious community, I can talk about any of their characters in any of their religious books or any of their concepts, knowing full well that they accept it as real and I accept it as unreal. I have to get to their level of thinking in order to communicate it all. But we're not talking about challenging Dickens' <laughs> characters here. We, we are because a lot of believers out there. Well, that they are uh, supporting a fictitious character uh, which was invented by humankind. Do you think you'd make more progress if you didn't uh, knock uh, God and religion so much and just concentrated the efforts on getting a government and, uh, and, and church uh, and religion and politics really separated the way that uh, sounds like the Founding Fathers wanted? Well, I think that I, we are making a, a great deal of progress. American Atheists is a good, viable organization, and we're moving uh, in a continuing way, expanding in what we're doing. Yes, we are making progress, and in order to make progress, I don't have to be dishonest. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hello, this is Linda from West Virginia, and I would like to know if you've read your son's book, My Life Without God, and what your comment is on that. I never make any comment on what my son is doing because I'm here to represent atheism and he's out there to represent God. He was on our program. There's no, there's no <laughs> love lost between the two of you folks. I was going to hope that I could bring you together and reunite you and no way. bring some happiness between you. No way. Oh, but parent and, and, and the, you know, mother and son, that's no way to go through life. That's, that's, that's to each that's his own, and my way is for me to continue to do what I feel is important for uh, not alone the American people, uh, but uh, for uh, church-state separation and for the politics of the nation. He doesn't feel that way, and he goes his way, and I go mine. Now, is it possible, now, and I'm not going to pursue this because I know it's a little <laughs> sensitive area, and you have a right to your own privacy, but let me ask uh, you in this arena. Uh, obviously, there's been some bad words no. publicly back and forth. No. Not together, but no. I mean, no? No, because my son uh, does a circuit in which he defames me. Watch and see if That's I defame him tonight. And the answer is always no. It takes two to tango, oh. and I don't tango like that. That's not my uh, um, forte. Is, is, is your anger, anger there not so much uh, with the, the fact that he's saying negative things about you, or more that he just believes in God and is going oh, on, on that circuit? I mean. <laughs> I mean, does, is that the reason? Uh, no. The reason is that I, for instance, would not um, get into a public uh, debate with Falwell because I feel he comes from false premises. And the same way uh, with William J. Murray. Incidentally, I think that it's sad and tragic that no one even knows his name. Uh, he is billed in a continuing way as son of Madeline. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is um, an onus laid on him. Uh, that uh, is punishment enough for anything he might conceive. Is that son of Madeline? Um, what I'm saying is he is not known in his own right. He is only known for defamation of his mother. And that's tragic. That's sad. Yeah. Why do you hesitate in answering that question? You because are his mother, aren't you? Yes, I am his mother physically, yeah. uh, emotionally, psychologically, of course. Sure. You want him known in his own right? Yes, he should be. Just as you should not be known as somebody's son. Yeah. You're your own man. Now? <laughs> I feel pretty good about it. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, sir. This is Van Davenport from McAllister, Oklahoma. Hi there. How are you? Okay. And you? Pretty good. Uh, I'd like to know what she thinks the morals 
and the principles of the young people growing up today would be out with our church. Oh, I think they would be so much better. It would be incredible. I think that we have to toe in on ethics and ethical behavior and the oughts of our culture and our society now. I think that it's uh, bad to uh, be involved with morality, which always has about it the sting of sin and guilt. And I would much rather see an in intellectual and reasonable approach to personal problems, cultural problems, political problems, and economic problems. Now, you're an attorney, right? I surely am. So you have a, you have a sense of ethics. You know, you have to have as an attorney. <laughs> I have a sense of ethics as a human being. As a human being? That's right. Okay. So you think that they can be found there without any outside guidance, or who would be doing the guidance? Uh, well, actually, I think that our culture uh, is guidance enough. For instance, you said that I am attorney, and what happens is, of course, in law, is that the law puts a floor mm -hmm. below which no one can fall. And if they fall below that, they violate laws which are established by the culture and they are penalized, uh, picked up, and uh, the society itself teaches them the lesson of not to do things which are unacceptable. We don't need uh, an extra moral agent someplace in order to do that. Now, you say that as a human being you have a, a grounding in a sense yes, of I ethics. Do. Now, don't you think something like the Ten Commandments is a pretty good uh, <laughs> uh, You know, the Ten Commandments, you know, the first three are absolute throwaways. They're no good because uh, the little Jewish God who uh, decided to give these commandments first recognized that there were other gods. And he looked at his people and he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, indicating that he knew from the Old Testament that there are half a dozen god yeah, tribes. There was gods a lot of name. idolatry going on. There was, there, there was indeed. Time. A lot of false and gods. And the second thing, the second commandment was, Thou shalt uh, remember my day to keep it holy. And there's a great deal of confusion as to whether that was because it was the seventh day of the creation or because it was the day in which they were brought out of uh, Israel. So there's a great deal of confusion But even if that confusion is there, there's a good reason to take a little break and rest, isn't there? There and is, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the God idea. It has to do with the cycles of human activity. Mm -hmm. I think we should also rest once a day, too. Mm -hmm. Whether that's day or night, we need sleep, we need recycling, we, we, we need rest. And once a week, too. Well, once a week, twice a week. I'm for as many holidays as we can possibly have. Well, I'd now, go listen, to the five-day week and have two days. Yeah, though, but if you're going to be an vacation. atheist, you're going to lose Christmas? You're going to lose Easter? Oh, I mean, no, we're not huh? going to lose them at all. We're going to gain them because, you see, these are all natural holidays set by the movement of the earth, and they have been stolen by the religious community to commemorate God ideas. What was the third commandment that you have? Problem well, with? the third commandment, uh, let me see. Remember my name to keep it holy and... Um, uh, no, do not have any other gods before me. I've forgotten the third one. Okay. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Uh, yes, I'm Lois, calling from Danville, Illinois. Go ahead. And my question for Mrs. O'Hare is, I see that she is a, a mature woman. <laughs> <laughs> Has she ever been ill or seriously uh, uh, thinking about, at a particular time, praying to God or praying for better health or praying to something greater that, that would make her well-being and healthy and so forth? Ma'am, I have uh, considerable physical problems, among others of which is that I am diabetic, and I would be dead right now if it wasn't for insulin and the fact that um, it was discovered and uh, people have been assisted uh, through insulin by medical science, not by God. Had it been left to God, I would have died without the insulin five years ago. So when I need any care, I go to a physician, I go to the kind of help that is needed for everyone who has physical ailments, and that's science, medical science particularly. I recommend it to you. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Uh, yeah, this is Cliff in Atlanta. Go ahead, Cliff. And she says that she complains about the tax-exempt status the churches have, yet the organization she runs is a tax-exempt organization and also receives the benefits that the same that the churches receive. How does she justify her complaint? First off, that's not true. There are four methods of tax exemption in the United States. One is under the ages of health, another education, another welfare, and another religion. In order to be exempt under either health, education, or welfare, one must prove that all of one's activities are directed either toward health, education, or welfare. The religious community doesn't have to prove anything. And because of that, 
they do not take their health, education, and welfare services uh, tax exemption under those since they would need to report how much money they got and how they spend it, but rather they take all of their exemptions under religion because they are not required to report their income or how that income is spent. For instance, it's a scandal as to the Roman Catholic churches uh, and their hospital systems as to what they have done with some of that money, which has not gone to hospital use. And uh, the scandals in relation to this have erupted during the last 20 years, at least on five or six occasions. I must prove to Internal Revenue Service for those uh, two organizations which I head, which are tax exempt, that they are educational organizations, that I received money for education, and that I disseminated for education. We have in the American Atheist Center in Austin, Texas, at least 10 organizations, and two of them are tax exempt as educational institutions, one of them being a library and the other a dissemination of information in respect to church state separation. So there are facets of the operation that are not tax exempt? Oh, yes, indeed. Like what would. Oh, of the American Atheist Press is not tax exempt, and uh, American Atheist Women is not tax exempt. The American Atheist Center itself pays a staggering tax uh, every year in ad valorem and other taxes. So some of them, uh, two of the organizations are tax exempt and two are not. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Uh, yes, this is Mark from uh, Oxen Hill, Maryland. Go ahead, Mark. I wanted to ask uh, Ms. O'Hara, first of all, um, how can she explain the way people are convicted of different things that bother them and turn to religion because I heard, I heard her make the statement that the young people would be a lot better without religion. Now my question is how would, uh, how does a person automatically turn? I mean a lot of people don't even know about God and all of a sudden, all of a sudden uh, they're convicted and they become uh, religious minded. How can you explain that if there is no God? I'll tell you, with the prison system and the court system today, if I was ever charged with anything and convicted, I would say, hey, sweet Jesus, where are you? Because I find throughout the prison systems that uh, those persons who are uh, converts, immediate, instantaneous converts on conviction, get a better deal in the penitentiary and on parole than those persons who are atheistic. Uh, one of the functions that we have right now is attempt, uh, attempting to organize in various prisons something called PALA, the Prison Atheist League of America, because you have no idea how the prisoners are subjected uh, to Christianity and to uh, coercive Christianity but let's in the go back to the, system. Let's go back to the spirit of this question, that some people indeed, under, under whatever circumstances, but he mentioned prison. Duress of some sort. Conviction, they, they find God, they, they ch their lives change. I think that they are frightened that they have been caught. I'm totally cynical about these people. Yeah. Totally. There's no spiritual dimension to your life, huh? Uh, certainly not in that aspect. I think that if someone, for instance, rapes a three-year-old girl uh, and uh, at the conviction of that rape suddenly finds Jesus and asks for forgiveness, yeah. he can't. One of the things that makes me angry is that religious folks constantly do this. Dennis, if I lay a bum rap on you, I can't turn over to this fellow over here and say, hey, you forgive me. I've got to go to you. And that's the difference mm -hmm. between an atheist and a religious person because they never go to the fellow that they gave a bum rap. They always go over to the third party, Jesus, and say, hey, Jesus, you forgive me for being rotten to this man. Yeah, well, you know, some things, uh, you know, people have to <laughs> apologize if they're wrong. They and do, they and, to, uh, and the amends. atheist they ethic is that amends. they must make amends where they hurt the person, oh, not to I, somebody else. See, sometimes you come along with these things, and I agree with you 1,000%. There you are, you're growing, maturing, becoming more uh, <laughs> <laughs> sophisticated more in every your step. approach. Yeah, but you know, but we disagree on a lot. <laughs> Oh, uh, we well, really do. Yes, but you're a decent person to disagree with. You should see those persons who put bullets through my windows. Well, see, that's what I see. I say that, uh, you know, you have a right in this country especially to hold the views that you hold. And I think that someplace along the line, although I disagree with a lot and I have to go on record as saying that, <laughs> that I think that you uh, perform a service of, of at least stimulating people's uh, thoughts, their imaginations, and their concerns about tax dollars and things like that, and I think that's right. Let me put an address on the screen. All right, if you want to get in touch with uh, Madeline Mario here in uh, Austin, Texas, there it is on the screen right now, Post Office Box 2117, Austin, Texas, 78768. 
Uh, what I'd like to do is tell anybody who writes to that address, we'll give them a free sample copy of our American Atheist magazine. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is the, the fall issue that's floating around right now. And uh, you could, uh, the second coming, Hollywood style, Reagan rings <laughs> uh, his T.H. bell on the prayer amendment. Uh, obviously, look, looks, looks like a conference yes. there someplace. And uh, discount purchase of foreign aid. The lunatics are at it again. Okay, well, this is all yours for the asking. Madeleine Murray says, Margaret Sanger, an article on Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger, Sanger was a very fine atheist. She was. Yes, indeed. We've got to go, friends. We thank Madeleine Murray here for visiting with us tonight. On the other side, we're going to talk about nutrition and the youngsters. Next on Late Night America. Now, later on tonight's program, you'll meet Eleanor Lenz. And she says that America is being feminized, that the millions of women who have left domestic life over the last two decades and moved into the working world are causing a veritable social revolution, not only in the workplace, but in almost every aspect of public and private lives. But now we're going to take a look at atheism. Now, when a nation founded on religious freedom, existing under God, that's the quote, as our Pledge of Allegiance states, where our money, where on our money, is printed in God we trust, what's it like to be a person who does not believe in a creator or a supreme being or any form of higher consciousness responsible for our existence? Is there freedom from religion as well as freedom of religion? Well, John Murray is one of America's foremost atheists. He is the director of the American Atheist Center in Austin, Texas. And John, it's good to see you. And maybe, before we go too much further, you could tell us the extent of the, of the Atheist Center, and then we'll get an idea of the, the scope of your activities. Well, the American Atheist Center is a 32-room office building. It's a million-dollar-plus complex of um, uh, direct mail, printing, computers, uh, just an office uh, that's the national headquarters uh, of the atheist movement in the United States. Uh, and from there, we direct some 40-plus chapters scattered all around the United States, as well as uh, national endeavors. Uh, for example, we have our own uh, half-hour American Atheist Forum, a once-a-week uh, television show on cable. We're mm -hmm. on about 82 or 83 cable outlets scattered throughout major you market areas. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, among others, we, we uh, have various persons involved in the show. We do some uh, direct news analysis with respect to separation of state and church uh, news, uh, church-state case news, and we also do some interviews. Um, and uh, we do uh, those kind of things, as well as uh, some of the legal things that we get involved in. Um, and it's all centered out of uh, Austin, Texas. You got that all really set up, what, around 77, right? Uh, we set up in Austin. We started there about 18 years ago, yeah. And uh, before that, we were in uh, Baltimore, Maryland with the founding of the organization. Uh, the organization was founded as a result of the original uh, Bible prayer case, of course, Murray yeah. versus Curlat. That was filed in 1959 and decided in June of 63. Okay, now, what I said in the introduction, do you have, as a practicing, or would you say practicing atheist? Certainly, I mean, that's your practicing way you live. militant atheist, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is there freedom from religion in our country? No, I don't think so. I feel that there's a tremendous amount of pressure, uh, both peer pressure, um, pressure in the workplace, uh, pressure in school, pressure uh, from our government uh, for persons in this country to be uh, religious of some kind or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a fair to midland type of freedom as in picking which religion you choose to partake in. But as far as saying none of the above, uh, that's where you run into uh, a great deal of hostility. And most of the atheists that I have met uh, throughout uh, all 50 states of our union uh, are timid about proclaiming themselves outside of the privacy of their own home. Would it hurt them uh, in the workplace? Atheists. Yes, it would. Uh, we've had a number of situations in which persons uh, have uh, either lost their jobs or have wound up uh, in a lower position 
uh, or have wound up with their ratings in a particular job suddenly changing when their employer finds out that they're an atheist. Uh, and they know what's going on. Uh, we have even taken some cases with some people like teachers, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that have been transferred out of a good teaching school into a remedial classes in another school or something when the administration finds out that they're an atheist. Off of something just as simple, for example, as writing a letter to the editor in their local paper yeah, and having, to, in respect to a separation of state and church issue and having the um, particular uh, principal, for example, see that letter. Okay. Are conditions in our country for an adult atheist somewhat analogous to, uh, say, in Russia for, uh, say, a Christian or Jew who would go there? I mean, is it that pervasive or...? No, I, I, I like to um, use the analogy of, for instance, uh, the black man in the South, like many years ago, or, for instance, the homosexual today. Mm -hmm. uh, when people find out you're an atheist, there's a misunderstanding of what that is of what it's all about, and you have the same kind of uh, looking askance at you uh, as, for instance, still happens even in Austin, Texas. For example, if you have a, uh, a mixed couple, a black man and a white woman walk into a restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, all of the heads are going to turn, uh, and they do that uh, with you. Uh, for example, I walk into a restaurant in Austin, Texas, and uh, uh, I'm recognized as the local atheist, uh, and uh, the conversation <laughs> kind of stops. You can uh -huh. just see this wave going across the room. Do some people kind of assume, John, that you can't be moral? Yes, uh, there's a definite uh, uh, linking of morality to religion. Uh, there's a myth, of course, that all atheists are atheists uh, uh, because there's some kind of, a, of an amoral creature, there's some kind of a criminal, we have to be a pervert of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, or that we have to um, uh, be a hunchback or have a hair lip or something and we're mad at God for punishing us in this way or we're angry at God somehow. Uh, and it's none of that. Uh, all of the atheists I know have reached atheism uh, as an intellectual uh, progression. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, they usually start the doubting process about the time of maybe late junior high or high school. Uh, and uh, when they go to college and they get away from the home atmosphere of maybe having to go to church as long mm -hmm. as they're under their parents' roof, they start to uh, do a reading and an exploring process and that's when they start uh, uh, going further and further intellectually away from religion. But for the most part, it's not an emotional thing. Okay, well, we'll talk further about to that. We're talking with John Murray, if you just tuned in. He's the director of the American Atheist Center. We're talking, of course, about atheists, their goals, their freedoms, and, of course, the problems that they face here. The subject of atheism is an emotional one, but can be discussed on a rational level, especially knowing our viewers. So if you have comments or questions for John, call us here. We're live in Detroit, 313-872-40. Four zero. What are the main complaints you would have as an atheist? You said there is that, that pressure, but complaints that you think could still be solved and everyone could still have their freedoms and, and kind of go uh, not bothering one another. Well, is it legal? Is it emotional? Is it uh, there financial? Are, <coughs> there are a number of different complaint areas. Uh, some of them are legal, for example. Some of our uh, uh, members are persons who are very much concerned about uh, the link between uh, state and church. Uh, for example, they uh, I feel that our government should not either be promoting or funding religion in any way mm -hmm. uh, from tax coffers, and some of them are concerned about the tax issue, for example. Uh, there are others that are concerned very much about the censorship issue. Uh, they're concerned about things like uh, Jesse Helms going after CBS, or they're concerned about um, uh, the, um, well, let, me, uh, let me just stop you there. Though. about the books or things you like say that. You say atheists could be conservative or liberal, right? I mean, there, there are a lot of different forms or a lot Politically, of different opinions. Yes. Yes. Okay. So why necessarily an atheist would not necessarily uh, be against a conservative going after CBS? You, or they're thinking from a religious standpoint. From a religious standpoint, you know, okay. and, and that's the kind of thing. They're very uh, aghast at the moral majority, for instance. Uh, uh, they um, uh, will tend to be uh, very aghast at the, um, uh, the television evangelists, for example, the fact that uh, they're scooping up more and more of the available airspace. They're really getting into the cable now. 
Uh, there are three or four now full-time uh, cable channels on a lot of cable systems. That kind of gets down to financial things, so too, of buying That's the right. time, though, right? So if you have yeah. more and you're, the more people you have, the more you can buy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we also, of course, uh, are concerned about the uh, uh, link with the current presidency, of course. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, is a born-again sympathizer, if not a born-again absolutely outright. Uh, and um, there is a fear about things, for example, uh, like that uh, he has appointed some 240-odd federal judges already since he has been in his first term and part of his mm -hmm. second term. All right, these are uh, people uh, who are uh, of a conservative bent with respect to separation of state and church particularly and are likely to uh, okay things such as uh, a prayer opening a city council mm -hmm. uh, or a creche scene in a, uh, a capitol building where it doesn't belong or those kind of things. Did so you, we have do, do you keep track of, say, if you're trying to help, say, an atheist judge get appointed or elected in the areas where they're elected, do you keep track of how many atheists there are in, say, the judicial system or in the uh, We try to keep lawyers? track locally of people who are uh, like any other cause organization who are the good judges or the judges that have been giving decisions on our side. Oh, yes, yes, we do. And we try to keep abreast of local politics, uh, whether it's a, a city council or a state legislature or a state senate race, of who the particular uh, candidate is on the separation of state and church You've worked issues. to get atheist jurors on juries, right? Yes, yeah. we've worked with a jury selection. Better? That's getting a lot better than it was. Uh, for example, now uh, in a number of states, instead of a person needing to swear or affirm, so help me God, with respect to testimony, they can now do what I do when I go into a courtroom, which is that I say um, that I will tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth according to my knowledge of the pains and penalties of perjury. And most judges will accept that, mm -hmm. that I'm saying that the deterrent for me is knowing the jail term I can get for perjury, not a supreme being of some kind. And most of the judges are accepting that kind of thing uh, rather than either a swearing or affirmation, both of which are so help me God. Mm. Um, so there are small um, uh, uh, victories like that that are still uh, victories of great importance to rank and file atheists. Okay, what percentage of our population would you estimate? And I always, you know, it's a good estimate of the number of atheists. I don't mean agnostics, but people who strictly do not believe in some creator. Um, if you look at the pollsters, it's a difficult thing. Uh, people like Gallup are hard to take seriously because of the way they do their polling about religion. But if you look at the uh, sociology departments and some of the people that go through the major universities, uh, they keep coming up with figures that are anywhere from 20 to 27 percent. That's one out of every five. They are hitting in that 20 percentile. Uh, with incoming college freshmen just with the students, they're hitting even up into a 35 percentile in places like uh, Northwestern or UCLA or places like that that they've um, uh, uh, done studies uh, on uh, incoming freshmen. So I think that there are quite a few atheists out there, um, and uh, particularly uh, amongst uh, some of the younger people. Okay. Are um, they evangelical in nature, we think of? No. They are You're not the, trying to convert anyone. No, they are the typical 20th century atheist, which is that uh, I don't believe in the God concept, I don't go to church, uh, and I just want to be left alone in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to have that used against me or to be harassed about it. Like, I don't want somebody coming by or putting a Bible track on my desk at work or something if they find out. And in the same way, they don't want to harass uh, anybody of any particular religion. No, we don't. That's one of the principles of our organization, actually, is that we do not seek to go out and to convert religious persons uh, to atheism. That's, that's not our ball of wax. What we, what we try to do is to go out and to find those persons who are already either agnostic or atheist and to try to let them know that A, there is an organization and B, that that organization can be a conduit for contacting other people in their community with whom they can share like views, A, and B, to uh, get literature on the subject, which is very hard to find. Uh, uh, most public libraries, if you go 
to them and look in the subject catalog under atheist, you will find quite a few books written by persons of various religious denominations telling you why you're crazy if you're an atheist, rather than anything written from an atheist point of view. Okay. Um, and uh, that's one of the things also that we're trying to counter, is to get just information out there to the public. Okay, good. Well, it's time for a quick break, and we will be back with your phone calls right after this. back talking with uh, John Murray, and we'll take your calls. Hello, you're on Late Night America. Yes, my name is Jay, and I'm calling from Houston. Hi, Jay. Um, hello. Go right ahead. I'm a former atheist myself, and there's one major problem that I've had with atheist literature and atheists that I've spoken with, and that's kind of a, a smugness, not in a haughty way, but the kind of sense that they've somehow gone through all the evidence and discern that there is no God, there is no evidence for it, and that somehow they are in a more moral position in their non-belief than those who believe in God are. I was confronted with evidence that I could not deny as to the reality of a God and to the validity of Christianity. And that's what convinced me that I was not doing the intellectual thing to remain an atheist to deny that evidence. And the funny thing that I find the result from that is that you have people in a position as atheists saying that Christians are being immoral in their position to say that atheists are wrong. Um, Whereas they, in denying of touchstone, if you will, of reality for right and wrong, have no position to say that anything is right or wrong or immoral or moral, except as it deals with them as particular people. Okay, Jay, let's see what John has to say about that. Thank you. I don't think that it's really a question of morality or uh, amorality or immorality, because I feel that, yes, he's right, and I know that a lot of atheists kind of have a superiority air about them, uh, that is that they feel that they are actually a little bit intellectually superior to somebody, particularly somebody that might be a fundamentalist, for example, that's really tied I'm, up. I'm glad to hear you say that, yeah, because in, some people in, feel, in, if you accept something that's traditional, then you couldn't be too bright. Well, some people feel just the opposite. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I again, I know that that comes over in uh, things that are written by atheists. Um, uh, in a lot of the literature, but the morality question, morality is a, is a relative thing, and morality changes over time, and it changes over culture, over geographical location, and I don't think it's a matter of us thinking that we're more moral, we just realize that morals string from uh, and come from human interaction between groups of people, that morals don't and ethics don't come from some ephemeral thing that is outside of nature, outside yeah. of the culture, that morals and ethics come from the interrelationships of, for instance, people uh, moving from a rural life to a city life, which we did at one particular point. And of course, that is your belief, in, in a, as you know, a fundamental Christian or, or would, other people would believe would, it comes from God and it's not changing. That's so right. That's the fundamental tenet. That's right. But as, again, as far as I'm concerned, you know, what was moral a hundred years ago, for example, in the United States, like like an address code is quite a difference from yeah. what more is moral right now. Well, I think in that way they would agree with you, too, yeah. it's just on some of the other issues mm -hmm. they would. Hello, you're on Late Night America. Okay, my name is Norm. I'm from Baton Rouge. Hi, Norm. And, uh, Mr. Murray, I understand that you're an atheist, and from that I take it to mean uh, that you believe that there is no God. And I'm wondering if that, if you don't think that that is as irrational a position as a theological statement or a position that there is a God, and if you don't think that agnosticism is the more rational of the two belief of the two positions good thanks sir okay well first of all i do not believe that's the wrong choice of words that that there is no god i have no belief systems at all i don't believe in anything i just accept that which is uh, and that which is verifiable the burden of proof in any philosophical system and this has been for classical philosophy for thousands of years uh, is that the burden of proof for the existence of anything is on the person who posits it. And the religious community has been trying with various classical arguments to prove the existence of 
uh, their supreme being for thousands of years to no avail. Uh, and uh, we just simply say uh, that uh, there is uh, not only no God, but there is no such thing as the supernatural. There is only the natural, that which we uh, uh, know about. When you say verifiable, you mean material, your senses? Yes, that can be verified through the scientific method, that can uh, have a variable presence, that can be verified uh, so that uh, uh, you can weigh it uh, or see it or with the extension of the senses, of course, uh, the microscope, so thought, that kind of thing. Thought. Well, because you can think of anything. I can think of hobbits or I can think of trolls that live under the bridges and mm -hmm. I can write for example, um, uh, uh, vast books about hobbits which have been written, very intricate tales. But that doesn't mean that simply because you can think of something that that thing exists. No, I mean, thought itself, a spiritual, uh, something you can't see, feel, uh, taste. Thought itself is based on a very physical presence, a physical thing. Without the brain, there is no thought. Thought is based on electrical mecha and mechanical impulses uh, within the brain. And without the brain, there is no thought. I mean, but you feel it's physically verifiable that thought does exist. Yes, yes, I think so. I think that as we're learning more and more about the human brain, yes. Hmm. Uh, okay, let's take some more questions. Hello, you're on Late Night America. Yes, good evening. Uh, for Mr. Murray, um, the one kind of issue I found, this is Santo from Syracuse, New York, by the way, Hi. Um, that I found uh, somewhat uh, strange in my uh, own personal understanding of the of, of atheism and the a evangelical side, if you will, of having cable TV programs, etc. Excuse me, uh, having difficulty, the Santo. Can we get him back, perhaps? Okay, we're going to take another call, and yeah. perhaps we can get him back. Hello, you're on Late Night America. Uh, this is Betty from Michigan, and I would love to. But at the moment, hmm. all I'd like. To having just a. Uh, Little difficulty. We'll go back. Okay. Uh, he brought up the whole idea of of things being uh, well, the, the the contradiction there that he saw, and you were talking about things being verifiable. When you say that atheism is basically materialism, that's people think of it in negative terms then right away, don't they? When, because they think of materialism. Well, yes, because they think of materialism in terms of like oh, uh, being a glutton, for example. Mm -hmm. They think of that as materialism, driving a Rolls Royce. That's not materialism, of course. All of philosophy uh, over the ages has fairly much been divided into two camps. Uh, those persons uh, who are um, idealists or uh, practice an ideism, that is, that the idea or the thought or the concept came first and then the physical matter came from the idea, and those persons that are materialists that say no, the material substance had to uh, be first and then ideas had to evolve from the brain or the physical substance. And that has been a dividing uh, split down through all of the major uh, uh, philosophy, dividing it into uh, those two major schools ever since uh, the days of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, and of course the atheist uh, finds himself squarely on the uh, materialist side of that kind of chicken versus the egg argument. Okay, it is. Too. <laughs> Hello, you're on Late Night America. Yes, this is Betty from Detroit, and I would like to ask John to tell us his definition of the difference between atheism and humanism. And humanism? Okay. Well, to me, an atheist who is, is a person who is free from theism. That is, whatever the particular theological um, accoutrement is that you carry around with you, uh, we don't have any of that. Uh, a humanist, to me, is a person who is concerned with humanity and with the welfare of uh, the human condition and the amelioration of the human condition. And to me, you, uh, anyone can be a humanist. You can be an atheist humanist or you can be a religious humanist. That humanism transcends uh, the idea of religion at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, I can be a humanist and the Pope can be a humanist. People tend to uh, lop humanism with secular humanism. With secular humanism. And I okay. feel that secular humanism is a misnomer. 
secular humanism is a straw man that the fundamentalist community has put up uh, in their fight to gain entrance into the public schools. And they say, well, there's this thing that exists that is secular humanism. And what they define secular humanism as is actually any academic subject that is not directly teaching religion, that's secular humanism. And so they say, okay, we'll define that as a religion for our purposes in order to get traditional uh, religion into the public schools. And uh, I, I don't buy that argument at all. To me, okay. algebra isn't secular humanism. Okay. Depending on who teaches it, I guess. That's right. Hello, you're on Late Night America. Hi, this is Judy from California. Hi, Judy. And my question is, uh, in the Bible, in Genesis 1-1, it states that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, basically what I'm asking is and what I've always felt my first impression when I heard somebody was an atheist was how can they believe this and what who did who do they attribute this beauty of the world and all of the majesty that it has and who who do they give this give the credit to is that your question Judy yes okay. uh, well basically how where does your faith come from and how do you believe as far as what we're made of and what the world is made of. Okay, Who gets he, that credit? You okay. probably wouldn't use the word faith, though. No. Well, there are, there are actually two separate questions there. Uh, and one of those is, of course, the ultimate, which is what's the origin of the universe, the whole entire origin? The answer to that is that I don't know and the scientific community doesn't know. There are a number of theories as to the origin of the universe. We're still gathering data and none of those theories is absolutely provable yet because there's, there's just too much data more to gather. Uh, as to the origin of human beings, I think that's pretty much scientifically demonstrable. There is so much evidence that we have evolved and changed form over the years. There's of course, so you've heard all the other arguments. Yes, where did it start? Archaeological the, the theory, evidence and all. Big Bang Theory, yeah. this is illogical as, uh, as yeah, creation yeah, to some people. Uh, well, but again, it's, it's, it's it's a theory, and my point of view is, if you don't know, if nobody knows the origin of the universe, why cover up that collective ignorance of all of mankind with the concept of God? Uh, you do that to make yourself comfortable, or you do that just so that uh, you somehow lessen your insignificance, because actually we are rather insignificant. The earth is just like a speck of sand on an entire beach. Some people feel that that makes them feel more significant, though it gives fuller meaning to their lives. Yes, it, it does, you know, but to me, uh, to some people, but to okay. me as an atheist, I don't need that. Okay. Uh, the fact, and this leads, uh, and sorry for interrupting, there's so many points to, yeah, to cover yeah. tonight, but the fact that you feel there's no afterlife, how does that put you on issues of abortion or uh, treatment of the terminally ill? How do you feel? I guess atheists feel differently, though, don't they? Atheists feel differently, yes. There's a, there's a I mean, big, among them. Uh, among them, there's a vast, there are some atheists that are um, uh, very much uh, anti-abortion, for example. Uh, personally, I feel that the issue in abortion uh, is not one uh, of a reverence for life. The issue there uh, is the sanctity and control of a woman over her own bodily processes. The woman, not the man in the relationship, or not the doctor, has to carry that child to term. And it's a woman's decision based on input from uh, uh, the man or the husband, and based on input, medical input, and based on economics. Uh, and other things that has to make that decision. And I don't think that that decision can be taken out of the hands of the, of the woman by the state or anybody else. Of course, that's your personal, you say that's atheist my, theory. And atheists widely differ on that. Mm -hmm. uh, on, um, on other issues, they differ. They differ on capital punishment. They differ on a lot of, uh, okay. on a lot of things. Hello, you're on Late Night America. Oh, I'm Bud Hulk from Saginaw, Michigan. Hi. And I just want to make a comment that uh, I think that uh, atheism, is, atheism is as much as a uh, religion as all the others, except for Christianity, which is above atheism. But I just uh, think the media has been dropping that word a a uh, religion and keeping it all separate from atheism. And uh, I'd like to hear a comment about that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, again, we are constantly 
in a process of other persons attempting to define atheism and attempting to define it as a religion. If you look at all of the world religions, they all have a kind of a set of common attributes, uh, and among those, for instance, is a belief in something that is outside of nature, that's, that's, that's uh, supernatural, uh, the belief that that thing or entity or power can be communicated with, that that communication can lead to that entity or power reaching back into the natural realm, and that's usually called a miracle, in order to assist from that plea for help. Uh, and that, um, for example, uh, some religions say that one cannot communicate directly with the supreme thing, that you have to go to an intermediary, which is the priest, minister, or rabbi, tell the intermediary, and like your lawyer, they will interpret it to this larger thing out there, what you're asking. Uh, and there's all, uh, there, there are all kind of attributes uh, to all of the religions, none of which atheism has. Uh, we have none of those. We don't have a particular dogmatic holy set of scriptures. Uh, atheists are eclectic by and large, uh, and they get... Um, I would think they have to be. They have that yeah, one fundamental uh, concept, right. and they, they can and then, vary. And then beyond that, they vary, and they get their input from a number of sources. What do you see, and I'm sure a number of people ask you, uh, and I don't mean it humorously, but what if you're wrong? Well, that's... And I'm sure you're asked that many that's times. That's the classical Pascal's wager from the famous French philosopher. Uh, the way I answer that always is that uh, if I am wrong, I have lived a full life and I have uh, done and gone and seen and explored and done whatever I could during my life uh, and have tried to be a productive citizen. But I think so many religious people use their life in preparation for death. Uh, and that death is the wonderful thing, and that everything wonderful will come after they're dead. Wouldn't uh, you like that, though? And, uh, no, not at all. I, I, I mean, as nice as this is, wouldn't you like it to be better? I couldn't imagine living forever, uh, one. And number two, uh, I think that if we're going to be working for a heaven-like concept, we need to be working for it for everybody right here, right now uh, on Earth. We can you do both of those? Conquer the, the the disease. We need to get rid of the slums. Yeah. We need to. Can take we do that, both though? That yeah. heaven concept. Well, I think we can and we cannot. They're not mutually exclusive. I mean, religion no. and doing all those good things. In fact, some people think they're exactly the same. Yeah, but at the same time, though. Uh, I think that some of the emphasis for doing the temporal is a little bit lost because you always have in the back of your mind, well, I'm going to be better off in heaven anyway, so if I don't get it done while I'm alive, uh, I'm going to be better off. Uh, and one of the things I see is, for instance, some of the people that have gone out of their way historically to make life better have been some of the atheists, uh, for, for example, in history. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Thomas... As well as some religious yeah, people. As well as, yeah, as well as some of the religious people, yes. But still, uh, there's, um, uh, to me, that's my motivation. I think that we have to do some things right now while we're alive. Okay. Is it possible to have calm discussions like this? Do you have many, or do people attack you or think you're attacking them? Most of the time, it's very hard to have a calm discussion uh, with, a, with a lot of religious people. There is a, a sense that I'm trying to somehow snatch their god away from them like you would snatch a candy bar away from a child, uh, and I'm not. Uh, and there is a lot of um, uh, hostility. I think that when people realize that atheists are normal, everyday citizens that can be in any walk of life. Uh, their postman can be an atheist. Anybody next to them at the desk in the office can be an atheist just as well as anything else. And we're just normal people uh, in the community. Uh, I think it diffuses a lot of that. But there is a lot of standoffishness, an immediate thing of somehow uh, you are not right uh, if you're an atheist. On a personal level, and this is just asking you a personal question, uh, most people knowing your mom, seeing her, is it difficult for you as her son to have your own personal identity? She's a very forceful woman. Oh, Do you agree with her? Is. Of course it is. Of course it is. I'm in the same position that many sons and daughters of public figures are. Yeah. Yes, it is very hard to uh, uh, separate. Uh, we share a lot of opinions and then we don't. Uh, some of my modus operandi in pursuing different is different than the way she pursues the very same issues. Do you ever see your brother who doesn't share your thoughts anymore? No, I haven't seen or had any personal contact with him in about five years now. Hmm. All I know about him is what I see in the papers. Do you find, is that saddening to you as brother to brother, aside from all these other issues? Ah. Uh, 
Yes and no. I, I, I never really got along with my brother very <laughs> famously anyway, as a lot of siblings don't. I Especially mean, just, when they're young. Yeah, when, yeah. when, when you're young. And, and there was a large separation because there's nine years difference in us. Oh. And that didn't come to getting along very well because we were in entirely different schools and circles and age yeah. groups. But um, uh, I have a curiosity to know from the inside exactly why he's doing what he's doing right now. Uh, and I don't. I only have my own speculation. Okay, John, it's interesting talking to you. I want to remind the people out there uh, your address at the center, American Atheist Center, P.O. Box 2117, Austin, Texas, 78768. John, thanks very much. You're quite welcome. And when we come back, how women's values and styles are changing our public and private lives. Eleanor Lenz says that the changes are numerous and that America is being feminized and will never be the same again. Tuesday, film star Jane Russell discusses her candid autobiography. And we'll take a look back at the first Super Bowl championship with Jerry Kramer, former Green Bay Packer. Wednesday, an attorney for abused children speaks out against a system that loses children between the cracks. And New York Times nutrition writer Jane Brody. And Thursday, rock journalist Dave Marsh critiques the music industry. Transcripts of Late Night America are available by sending $3.50 to Late Night America Transcripts, Post Office Box 25621, Overland Park, Kansas, 66225. Tapes of the program are also available. For more information, call 913-649-6381.